and we'll go ahead and get started. I'm really excited about today's um, K through 12 technical council meeting. By way of introduction, my name is Jill Buck and I'm the founder and CEO of the Go Green Initiative. And I have been with CRRA for many, many years and have uh, been very excited to be part of the technical council. Um, gosh, I've lost track of how many years, but we have some other executive committee members for the K through 12 Technical Council on with us today. And I'd love to give each of them a chance to introduce themselves. We'll start with Dr. Cecile Carson. If you could say hi and your affiliation, Cecile. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, I am the executive team lead for Keep California Beautiful. Thank you, Cecile. And Cynthia, down in hi. SoCal, say hello. Hi, SoCal. Hey, I'm Cynthia Van Tol. My company is called Mary Posa Equal Consulting. I've been a member in good standing with CRA, I think, for like 25 years. Um, and Since you were I, 10, right? Since you were 10, just 10. Yeah. yeah. And okay. I actually oversee, I'm the recycling manager for LA Unified School District. Wonderful. Thank you, Cynthia. Debbie Dodson from the Carton Council. Say hello. Hello, Debbie Dodson, Carton Council. Um, always great to have these meetings and thank you jill for putting all the work in and cecile i appreciate it um no so happy to be joining us all wonderful thank you debbie and i saw devin jackson also on the executive committee say hello devin if you're still with us hi everybody you, there you are i uh devin jackson i'm a science teacher at the mount diablo unified school district and uh foothill middle school and I like to consider myself to be a uh, sustainability coordinator for my district, but that role doesn't exist. So I kind of made it up. Um, <laughs> yes. And I'm also on uh, the K-12 Technical Council, the, the not board, but the, uh, the committee. Um, and then I'm also a board member. I'm the current vice president of NICRA, Northern California Recycling Association. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Devin. Well, I'm going to hop right into it. And I know we'll have folks that are still joining us as they come in. But I am really excited to have two guests here today from Lunch Assist. Allie and Emily are professionals in the child nutrition services space. And their organization, Lunch Assist, helps school nutrition departments throughout the state and in other states um, comply with a number of different USDA programs, um, you know, a lot of different things, but they have some familiarity with SB 1383 as well. So I'm going to give them a chance to present to you all some of the things they do. And by the way, if you're with a city or a county recycling association and you feel like your school districts in your jurisdiction need some extra help, this is something you can fund, a contract with Lunch Assist. And so I want to I want to put that kind of seed in your mind as you're listening to Allie and Emily, because the services they provide might be very well suited to your district and to your needs. So they're going to talk to us about what they do, talk to us about food share tables, edible food recovery, preventing food waste and some of the pain points that they are dealing with. And then we're going to give everybody a chance to ask some questions. So Ali and Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, we're so excited to be here and just thankful for the invitation um, and just to share the good word of Lunch Assist and tell you how we're working with districts um, related to SB 1383. So we have a few slides prepared for you, but mostly we want to keep this a dialogue. So we ha also have questions for you. Uh, so we can get started. I'll share my screen if that's okay. That's perfect. You should be able to. I made you a co-host, Allie, but let me know if you have any trouble. Wonderful. Okay. So um, I just wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about Lunch Assist and some of our offerings and then tie that into SB 83. And um, Emily's going to talk more about like the consulting, what we're hearing um, out in the field, um, questions that we have, um, questions that our schools have. So um, let's get started.
Okay, well, first of all, here's the Lunch Assist team, smiling big and bright. Um, we are a, you know, a group of former um, um, state reviewers, uh, school nutrition operators, menu planners, um, people with backgrounds in finance and marketing. And we really just try to um, dig deep into the regulations and operational concerns that districts might have that, um, you know, you know, we, we focus on those things so, so that they can focus on feeding kids. Um, uh, we really geek out on regulations and what do, does the guidance really say and what is the intention. And so um, we just really love to serve our districts all over the country, not just in California. Is my sharing bar going across the slide? Because I can see it on mine. Oh, perfect. Great. Uh, so a little bit about our services. So our, our biggest platform and where we have the most uh, enrollment is our Lunch Assist Pro portal. So it, it just has a wealth of, um, you know, training videos, checklists, templates, um, procedures that you can look through and, and you can change them and implement them in your own district. Um, I was a child nutrition director for seven years and I've been in the field for about 12 and I can speak for myself and I think other people who are now in more of a supportive role that I wish I had these resources when I was a child nutrition director can feel like really isolated work. And so having um, consultants and these tools at, at my disposal would, would, would have just made my job so much easier. Um, for California districts, we also provide one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting. So that's monthly or bi-monthly calls where we really take a comprehensive look at their program uh, we're also keeping our ears open to like the latest guidance coming from the USDA and the Department of Ed in California and uh, really um, boiling that down and simplifying it so we can um, share it with our clients to, to make th this new guidance as easy to implement as possible. So we really love our jobs and we really love working with child nutrition, nutrition directors and their programs. If you want to stay connected with us, we have... Um, a lot of social media platforms that we're a part of and we're active on. Uh, you can also email us and we do have a website. And as Jill was mentioning, um, you know, contracts are, you know, allowable purchases with child nutrition funds. There's also a lot of kit funding out there in California. You may, you may have heard of that funding source. And Lunch Assist is a, an allowable expense and we can do multi-year contracts and things like that. Uh, so happy to help your districts in any way we can. Um, but now I'd like to ask you all a few questions. So feel free to come off mute. And uh, we're always curious how people in external roles are supporting schools. And um, we feel like today we could also learn a little about of the work you're doing and how um, thinking of ways that we might be able to take what you say back to our clients. So our first question is what role um, do you play in helping districts implement uh, SB 1383? Anyone can answer. This is, we're just very curious about this. Well, this is Cynthia. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, we've been doing food waste and organics for years at LAUSD. Um, unfortunately, when it came to food share this last year, we had this, they, uh, County Health asked us to stop the food share. So we're not doing that right now. We just implemented Long Beach School District. This is our second week of our pilot program, 11 campuses. We are doing organics and food share, but what the um, cafeteria um, nutrition director of nutrition did was she purchased these uh, black, they're like trays you put in the freezer and the food shares to the side. So as we're doing our stacking of trays and pouring the milk and uh, you know organics recycling, we were told not to touch that food share uh, container. They don't want the uh, us to touch it. It's only handled by nutrition um, in the cafeteria. And at the end of the day, they are if what's not um, being you know what the kids are not taking is going into compost. So and we're cool. doing those live. I, I mean, I just came back from one of the campuses. So 
that's what's going on in Long Beach School District. We're uh, we're going to prepare to do the next ten campuses in about two more weeks. Wonderful. Who else would like to share what you do? Because we have a variety of different jobs. Here, <laughs> that's where. Monica, is that you? I think maybe she's not muted. But would anybody else like to share with our friends from Lunch Assist what you do at the city or the county or as a third party organization? Stephanie, I saw you unmute. Go go for it. Right. Thank you so much and so excited to be here. So I'm with US Green Building Council. And I will say for any of those that are interested in LEAD or are part of the LEAD community, we have just launched LEAD version five for public comments and we want to engage everybody in our public comment process. I run the True Zero Waste Program and work closely with our Center for Green Schools. And I've seen uh, many of you at the Green Schools Conference in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and we're just here to help, help your organization get to zero waste and provide resources, provide peer-to-peer -peer networking, um, and hopefully lead to true zero waste certification. But um, I've known Jill forever and just so excited to be back in this network. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And Mayra, I see your hand up. Talk to us about your role in helping schools implement SB 1383. What are you hearing? What are you doing? Hi, everyone. So um, my name is uh, Mayra Estrada. I work for the city of Chula Vista. Um, and as a city, we're rolling out our food waste collection program. So um, we're really in charge of providing outreach and education to essentially all generators in the city. So um, we're going through our commercial businesses, our multifamilies, our residents. Um, and I've been specifically tasked to do outreach for schools because I previously worked for the Chula Vista Elementary School District um, as a sub and um, as an attendance health secretary. And um, that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. Um, and so really I've just been connecting with at least uh, admin at the district levels. We have probably one of the largest K through six districts in the state um, as far as the Chula Vista Elementary School District um, and our Sweetwater District, which is also a very large um, seven through 12th uh, district. Um, and there's been a lot of challenges. Um, there's a lot of resistance to, you know, share tables, to even the food collection. Um, luckily, we've had at least that biggest district has finally gotten uh, the food collection service, um, but really only our child nutrition services um, personnel are using it in the kitchen. There's still no sorting <laughs> involved. Um, they're very early in the stages. So um, just some of the challenges up front have been really um containers. They don't really have funding for containers. A lot of schools are losing enrollment. And so that's probably one of the biggest challenges is, um, you know, really having them have the tools to implement it. So um, I'm excited to kind of hear what everyone has, um, you know, any suggestions or what other people have done to kind of get over these hurdles. But yeah, I'm excited to be here. Great. Thanks, y'all. Um... I might combine um, the next two questions and feel free to answer them how, however you'd like. What are you hearing from the schools that you work with? And two is what do you wanna hear from us today? Because we can kind of, we, we have some things we'd like to sh share with you, but we might be able to give some specific examples based on what you'd like to know from us. Stephanie? Yeah, I'll just share quickly. I think there's a lot of issues around franchise agreements and schools feeling disempowered with their waste haulers. And um, I'd love to share in the future of what we're doing with schools and businesses to shift to a material management program versus the waste management program. Especially in California, there's so many reprocessors here that will pay you for your source separate materials and help you source separate your materials. So I just really want to continue to emphasize that, that zero waste is about saving and making money. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars um, for school districts. So just we're moving into a really positive um, 
unique um, opportunity. And also there's so much software out there now that will help you do your tracking. There's apps, there's, we're just moving finally into the 21st, 22nd century uh -huh. with our management programs. Anyone else want to indicate to Allie and Emily, I mean, they are child nutrition services specialists. Um, what questions do you have for them? What do you want to know about school nutrition programs as it pertains mm. to SB 1383? Myra. Um, so I think I posted on the um, chat board once about this, but um, mainly the a lot of the issues I've come across is them. Um, a lot of these schools do receive um, free meals. And so there's a lot of challenges with them um, you know, not wanting to donate the food because they get reimbursed for them. And so um, the logistics really with reimbursable meals and the ability to donate. And so um, that's one of my major concerns because, uh, you know, especially the biggest district we have, um, that's the reason why they do not want to donate at all. So um, any suggestions or, you know, tips on that? Explain to me this share table that you have, because, you know, like I said, with LAUSD, I have 652 campuses and Ooh. yeah, you know, I, I have LAUSD. I used to have 850, but now I only have 652 campuses and Long Beach is 78. And I see John Levy's on here. Um, we have to have that food. That food could only be served and has to be served. And in that share only for so long you know before we it has to be thrown away so mm -hmm. i'm looking at your share i'm looking at what you have here can you explain that also i do want to know about your funding and then also we don't use any specific containers we just you know for picking organics we use buckets but for the in both of our my school districts we just use a like i said a, a cooler like they like that black thing there it's mm -hmm. frozen. It's put in the freezer and they put it out. And but it's only, you know, like 25 minutes, 30 minutes, yeah. and then it's gotta mm -hmm. go. Help the department right. allow it. So explain well, you explain that to me. Mm -hmm. And last question that we'll go to is Debbie. And then if you have any other questions you want lunch assist to um answer, you can put it in the chat. But Debbie Dotson, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna defer my question just to go back to Myra's because I think Myra had a really good question um about how to convince um her the donation of the food it's her, she's getting resistance from her school district because it's federally funded and i think that is a really good question that um lunch assist could answer so i'm going to defer back to myra mm -hmm. great well i can um speak to the share table and and then we can move on to kind of some other points in the presentation but um basically what the share table accepts, and Emily chime in here if I'm missing anything, are um, shelf-stable packaged foods, um, uh, fruits that have uh, that have thicker peels that uh, you you don't eat, um, or things that are 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 packaged like milk or you know prepackaged vegetables that are kept in the cooling area. You would have students would have to put that in the the cold or um, the ice kind of bath area. So not all foods can go. So, so there is a little education that is involved with the share table. Um, you know, students aren't allowed to put like their chicken nuggets or a slice of pizza there. You know, there are some parameters around what can go to the share table. So those items might go to food waste composting or unfortunately um, into the landfill. But, you know, th that's those are the parameters around the share table. Um, and, uh, they can even either go back into the operation once they're kind of cleaned and put in back into inventory or students can take them, um, to, to have an extra portion or, um, you know, take, take back to class with them. Emily, did you want to add anything about share tables? Yes. Yeah. I think that one of the other things just to add on what you just said about what can happen with the share table once, um, food is on it. Um, students can eat it and there's a lot of regulations in school nutrition about ensuring that like the, the majority of what we do in school nutrition, our goal is to provide nutritious meals to students during the school day. That's our overall goal. 
Um, and so there's a lot of regulations that govern that. And one of them is that food waste, even leftover um, portions, or if you're donating food, that there's really specific requirements around that donation point. Um, and so like, Food service people usually want to have a really tight control of what happens to that food after it goes to the share table. So like Ali said, it's either coming back to the cafeteria or it's coming back to the cafeteria and the cafeteria is then ensuring that it's getting donated to a nonprofit uh, since they're restricted to only donating to nonprofits. Um, I think a lot of times we hear from schools that they're like, well, teachers and parents want to just be able to take the food from the share table and distribute it how they want to distribute it. And that's not really an allowable practice um, per se, but we'll get into that a little more too later on. Mm -hmm. um, great. So I think what we'll do next is, you know, Emily and I and the other consultants are hearing a lot of the same, same things you're hearing. And, you know, we're, we also have some of the exact same questions you have. <laughs> you know, there could be a little more clarity around this. We we want to guide our clients in, in the best way possible. And so, you know, when we reach out to CDE or maybe other districts that are a little, little further ahead, we're, we're having these same questions. So uh, Emily's going to share a little bit next, um, but I'm also going to write some questions down that are coming into the chat and um, I'll read them at the end here and maybe we can go through them. So. Emily, um, take it away. And Emily is a former uh, reviewer, state agency reviewer from Montana. So she knows compliance, like the back of her hand. I'm always in awe of like how she can take a regulation that makes no sense and simplify it to make it make perfect sense. So um, Emily's going to take a little bit, uh, uh, take take it on from here. Awesome. Thanks, Allie. Um, I just love this group dynamic here. I feel like this is conversations I have with my sister all the time because she is a consultant for a new uh, recycling systems uh, company out of Denver. So I think does some similar work to you. So some of this vernacular that's really foreign to me, I feel I often filter through her. So now all the acronyms you throw at us, I'm just going to take back to her and screw about. Um, but like you all, school nutrition has its own set of vernacular regulations and rules. Um, if you look at school nutrition regulations governing school nutrition, it's probably far more complex than like the US tax code. There are so many regulations around school nutrition. So we thought we'd start just sharing a little bit about like what we've been hearing from clients, what we have available, and a few tips on like other other items that reduce food waste. So what we've been hearing um, from clients is that we have clients that are ranged from like a, a school district that has a hundred kids in a rural area in the mountains, all the way to giant districts, what I consider giant, um, you know, your big city um, coastal towns in California. And so some have been preparing for this legislation for years and have green teams. And just like some of you have recycling managers, which is a totally foreign concept from where I come from, where schools wouldn't even have that infrastructure at all in place. Um, and some schools have never even heard about this legislation. Um, they have one person running the kitchen um, and it's a really small operation. And so when we bring it up on our consulting calls, um, sometimes it's the first they're hearing about it. Um, in general, I think the theme I sense from working with one on one with clients, that's what I do all day is just chat with clients around California and see what they're feeling. I pick up on a kind of general sense of a little bit of confusion around like, who's going to be monitoring me? What are the regulations? What do I need to do? Does it vary for the size of school I am? Um, there's just a lot of questions. I think people are excited about it, nervous about it all at once. Um, um, yeah, so uh, some schools are already already working on this legislation and some haven't even started. I think that it really runs the, the spectrum across our client share. Um, when we work with clients, we have a lot of resources available and we really try to troubleshoot any regulation with our clients. So we focus a lot on federal child nutrition policy and state child nutrition policy, but then anything that tangentially touches child nutrition. So Senate Bill 1383 obviously has impacts to child nutrition. So we've been furiously researching this and sharing out what we know with our clients. 
So current and prior to Senate Bill 1383, we work a lot with our clients on setting up templates and sample policies and procedures and SOPs for their share tables, um, for their donations uh, out to nonprofits for their leftover food. Uh, we provide a lot of professional standard training for school nutrition folks. There's actually a requirement that school nutrition staff have to have, um, well, food service directors need a set amount of hours and all food and nutrition services staff also need hours. So what we do is a lot of um, providing that content to schools. Um, when we're working with clients too, one of the main things that's always on our mind is we want to make sure schools have a streamlined way to manage their waste once waste occurs. Um, but we don't get very much money in child nutrition normally. Kind of right now, there's a little bit of surplus money in California, but typically this is a very frugal and very lean program. Um, so food waste is always at the top of most food service directors' minds on how to keep it to a minimum. Um, so in addition to managing waste when it's created, we also work with clients on other ways to reduce food waste. And we know there's a lot of really sound evidence-based practices that can reduce waste from even happening. So we work a lot with clients on implementing a meal service option called Offer Versus Serve, which is optional for grades K through eight required at high schools. And that's where kids can politely decline certain menu items. Um, and the meal is still reimbursable for the school. Uh, we really focus on implementing recess before lunch, which is not federally or state mandated, but when recess happens before lunch, what we see in the evidence and the research is that kids eat a lot more of what's on their plate, like far more. Um, so it's not generating as much trash for the waste bin later. Um, and then something else that we know really helps reduce food waste is having adequate time to eat. And that is not something that is federally regulated, state regulated. Some schools might have a local local policy on how long their lunch period is, um, but there's no set standard regulation saying how long it has to be. We really recommend at least 20 minutes of um, time sitting in your seat to eat. Um, and a lot of schools don't even make that benchmark. So kids don't physically have enough time to eat. Allie, is there anything else on those that you would add as a former operator that would really help reduce food waste? Um, if you didn't already say it, maybe menu planning. Um, did yeah. you touch on that? I was reading the chat. No. Okay. Uh -uh. So yeah. just smart menu planning. Um, if, if you're, if a manager or a kitchen staff is consistently having a lot of leftovers, you just read, uh, you know, you just pr prepare fewer servings the next time. So keeping good documentation and um, tracking consumption of those items over time can really help mm -hmm. kitchen staff hone the, the number of servings that they prepare and then can have fewer at the end of meal service. Yeah. And I would say most food service directors, like their main goal is prevention of the waste first, menu planning, having good policies in place to reduce waste and then the the waste management is kind of like secondary in their minds i mean it's still a big part of it but it's the second part of the equation in most food service directors um operation all right so because we work with a lot of clients we also hear a lot um firsthand of what clients are having issues with when implementing this bill um so like i said our clients vary in size and type we have charter schools, we have public schools. Um, and so it's it's a little bit all across the board. But one of the big things we've heard from a couple of clients um, is that, you know, they'll hear information on Senate Bill 1383 that they just need to like donate the food to someone. Um, you know, it, it can go to anybody. But there's really a federal regulation requiring that that donation of food has to go to a, a, a recognized nonprofit. Um, we actually in child nutrition have a federal regulation requiring any food left over has to be donated to a recognized nonprofit. Um, some of our schools have really been struggling with limited guidance. Um, I know Cal Recycle has this great page on, you know, uh, everything to do with Senate Bill 1383, but our clients really work a lot in like black and white and they want to see like the template, like a checklist of like, what do I need to be in compliance? And I want the exact template for um, everything to be out there and available so I know I'm meeting 
compliance. They're really into rules in child nutrition because we've got them so used to them with all of our federal regulations. Um, a lot of our clients are like some of you in more populated areas that have a lot of food recovery agencies and waste haulers. And if I get this terminology cross, please correct me. <laughs> this is my interpretation of what you all do. Um, but in a lot of the rural areas, they're still struggling to even figure out if they have a compost facility they can get their food to, if they have a nonprofit that's able to take um, food on a daily basis, a monthly basis, and as needed basis, um, it can be a really hard area to find information on um, for food service directors. Um, and then I think a lot of schools struggle with um, unclear division of responsibilities and reporting structures. And this is something we would love to hear more insights from you all on. Um, but like there's there's multiple people at a district that would play into the, the implementation of Senate Bill 1383. But oftentimes what we're hearing from food service directors is that it's coming to their desk. Um, but they're not necessarily the administrator that oversees all of the school district's policies and um, implementation of waste and contracts and um, food hauling. Um, and there's, um, you know, a lot of bigger districts have a designated maintenance and facilities department that would actually be the one holding the contract for their waste hauling and not necessarily the food service department. Um, and then I think one of the other things we've been hearing is just a little bit of confusion around who exactly is going to check for compliance on this? Like we know it's not necessarily CDE. Um, we know it falls to counties and cities, but a lot of our clients are getting um, kind of like outreach from a consultant working for a city or a county staff member reaching out about Senate Bill 80, 1383 um, or a city staff member. And there's really no clear delineation on like, this person will reach out to you, this is what compliance looks like, and this is when you need to report it. Um, and I think that kind of gives some of our clients a little bit of just like angst, that they don't know the answer to the test or what they're gonna be graded on and when. <laughs> um, and maybe that's out there, that's just what our clients are kind of sharing with us. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, sometimes I think a lot of the accountability for this falls to food service when it really needs to be a proactive approach across multiple departments, administration, maintenance, facilities, um, teachers, parents, um, your PTAs. Like there's a lot of people that might have their, their part in maintaining a good flow of waste from tray to share table to trash can to compost bin all the way out to the dumpster at the curb. Um, and a lot of this, um, we like to joke in child nutrition that like a new rule comes out like every fifth day <laughs> for child nutrition. The rules change a lot. We get a lot of new rules added all the time. Just today, um, a new whole suite of federal rules um, governing things from the meal pattern down to procurement just came out um, that schools will need to implement. So I think districts and operators have a really hard time um, kind of rolling with all the punches that come their way. Like there's a lot of things that a food service director has to keep on their plate and juggle. Um, and so one more thing added to their plate can sometimes get a little overwhelming um, if they don't have a good team of a recycling manager and a green team and a bunch of people helping them out to figure out this reg regulation. Yeah, so... What we're doing right now with clients, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, is we pass on any resources or information we know. So anything we glean or anything we pull from the Calvary Cycle website or your website or your cruise, we pass along to our clients. We help our clients set up share table um, policy templates. We help them set up their agreements with, um, with nonprofits for their donation of leftover food or um, soon to expire food. Um, so we've really helped clients start thinking about that MOU process with food recovery agencies and setting up their process for tracking donations. Um, uh, and we really help school food service directors, that's usually who we work with in districts, seek out the right people to ask questions to. Because sometimes we'll just get a panicked food service director that's like, 
I have to comply with all these regulations and I don't know what to do. And we're like, don't worry, you've got to phone a friend. You've got to, you've got a, a, a buddy down the hall, like maybe go talk with your maintenance folks about making sure that they ensure the green bins are where they need to be. So that's not on your plate um, every day when you're setting up for the lunch line. Um, and then we work a lot with clients on those preventive steps to reduce waste, things like Im implementing offer versus serve, um, 20 minute seat times, uh, and recess before lunch. Those are all things that do require a lot of um, support from administration and um, I guess school population in general, teachers, parents, uh, students. Um, and so we just, we help our clients navigate the waste management and the reduction of waste um, on a daily basis. Yeah, so we've got more questions for you. And I know you've got more questions for us, judging by the notifications I've been seeing on the chat. So, <laughs> Ali, do we have more questions we want to answer before we ask our Yeah, questions? Emily, this yeah. is Jill. We've got just a couple more minutes for your item on the agenda. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that if you have a question that hasn't been answered yet, please put it in the chat and we will send out written responses to everybody who's registered for today. Um, and so in the couple minutes that we have left, um, Allie and Emily, if you would answer our questions, that would be awesome. We of course can. Allie, do you have any hey. other questions? That yeah, you there talk? are. Um, well, Jill, I wanted to check in with you. Um, do we have time to go through these seven or eight questions, or do you want to continue on with your agenda? And Emily and I will write them up, and then we can just email them to you. Well, that'd be great. But you know what? If there are some burning questions that we can get to in a couple of minutes, we can absolutely do that. We've got time. Okay, great. So one of the first questions um, is somebody on the chat mentioned that they're having a difficulty finding 501c3 nonprofits who have the capacity to take this, um, the food donation. So can we speak to solutions that we've found? So I, I would start by saying that it really is so district specific um, you know, every community looks different, but, um, Emily, are there some things that clients are telling you, like some successes that they've had? I, I know we've heard a lot of challenges, but. Yeah, there's the directory from California Senate, um, Cal Recycle of, um, I think it's on their website of food recovery agencies. There's also like the Feeding America is a great resource for finding food bank institutions in your area. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we've been hearing from folks too. Like, even if there is a 501c3 or a food bank in town, sometimes they don't have the capacity to come to the school and pick stuff up and the school doesn't have the capacity to take it to them. So it's kind of this, uh, quandary of what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like sure to go on to the stuff. carrot app, go on to carrot. I'll type it, Emily. Okay. Allison. Mm -hmm. We, uh, many of us in our cities, our jurisdictions, including our school district, use Carrot. I will do it. You can go on. They yeah. identify all the locals, plus all the cities have to have that by now. They had to identify all their edible food and the regional food banks in their cities. That's already into their capacity plan. So just contact your city. And they should be posting that. But I just, I just posted the Carrot, and that's Allison. Elson, should she's uh, very involved with CRA, but you will find your people. Nice. There you go. Thank well, you. This is great. The care I'm gonna thank you guys. That's guys, I've been tip. doing this so long too. You know, I've been working with <laughs> schools for twenty something years. So, like mm -hmm. I said, I have the biggest school district, and we're we oversee all this. We're doing all this donation share and everything. Um, very cool. We've been doing it for years, so that's thank why you, honored. Cynthia. This is awesome. That's a that's a great tip. Um, I want to thank Ali and Emily for being with us. And I could see where maybe you know if if we had a working session with you all that we might be able to put together that definitive checklist that your folks are looking for. Um, that's what we're looking for as well. And so we're so pleased that Lunch Assist could join us today. 
And it, all of the questions that are in the chat, Ali and Emily have committed to answering, and we really thank you for that. So we will send that out via email to everybody who is registered for this. If you got the Zoom link from some other form than CRRA's registration, please put your email in the chat so that we can include you on the email answers. All right. Be sure to check out the, the templates and resources that we have hyperlinked in the agenda today. Those are, are about uh, food donation. They're the resources that we share with our clients and can give you some guidance on how we're um, advising our, our schools. Thank you so much, Allie. That's awesome. And if you didn't get the meeting agenda, put that in the chat. We'll make sure we get it out to you. But that was something that we put out um, last week. Happy to share it again. Now we're going to pivot to part of the answer to some of your questions. And, and Allie and Emily, this is something that, you know, for your child nutrition services departments who are like, why is this falling in my lap uh, versus, you know, the facilities manager's lap? Well, that's partly because they don't have a district green team, uh, a district green team that identifies everybody's lane. What's the facilities manager lane? What's the child nutrition services lane? What's everybody's responsibility when it comes to SB 1390, uh, 1383? And we're going to bring on my colleague, Mallory McGough from the Go Green Initiative to talk about a resource hub that she has created that is free. It's replicable. Any of you can download it right now today and take these resources and make them your own. If you are working with school districts and they do not have district green teams or they have dysfunctional district green teams, before we worry about school site green teams, a district green team is really key. And Mallory's gonna to talk to us a little bit about why that is. And Mallory, you can share your screen if you like and show us the resource hub. So everybody, Mallory McGough. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Michelle. Um, as she said, I'm Mallory with the Go Green Initiative. Um, and essentially what I do, um, and a lot of us at the Go Green Initiative do, is work directly with school districts to help them achieve their sustainability goals. Um, and here in California, of course, the big one is SB 1383. Um, and what we do is try to help them create a centralized, institutionalized approach to doing this so that they're not scrambling around site by site, and then we have a clear vision from a team at the top called the District Green Team. Um, so I will share my screen here. <clears throat> and I wanna show you where you can uh, find this resource hub before I go straight into it. So this is our website, gogreeninitiative.org. And if you click resources, uh, right at the top of that resource page will be this uh, Green Teams resource hub. Um, and as Jill was saying, this is something that we started putting together really for ourselves uh, to be able to easily find all of these documents, all of these web pages um, and templates that we've created for our clients as you know they brought problems to us. So how do I solve this issue with my hauler, uh, with my hauling service? How do I um, tell you know the other members of my district green team uh, you know what their role is and get them on board? So. We created this as a landing place for all of our tools, um, and now we've made it into something that hopefully uh, is useful to a lot of other folks. So a lot of the stuff in here, um, it's templates on Google Sheets or Google Drive or on Canva um, that you can just file, make a copy, and then completely customize uh, and make your own. So I'll start on the district office tab. Um, it was great to hear. Emily and Ali, you know, your experience of child nutrition services directors, you know, feeling uh, isolated by this is validating to what we see as well. Um, and, you know, we really think that by creating this team of senior leaders uh, at the district office, we've seen a lot of success in them being able to solve some of these other problems of getting their equipment in place, um, getting messages out to principals <laughs> that the food share table exists and how they should have their students uh, learn about it and use it properly and all of these elements that go into SB 1383 compliance that can't just lean on uh, child nutrition services. So on this page, we'll find resources that are really for those senior leaders, the heads of departments, um, like nutrition services, but also facilities, um, operations, um, as well as folks like you who may be 
helping out <laughs> those folks from the district office to comply. Um, so, you know, it goes into things like who should serve on a district green team, and we can see some of the uh, different roles that we recommend, um, including, you know, nutrition, of course, but facilities as well, HR, the school business officer, and the assistant superintendent of instruction. Um, so we see some of their roles. But further, there's information about how to form that team how to get all those people in the same room and what should they be discussing on a monthly basis to move this compliance work forward. So any of you who were at the uh, CRRA conference last year, we covered these slides that I'm scrolling through now um, that really talks about what does the district green team do? How do they work together um, and disseminate this information to the rest um, of the district? So that's all there and that's a great resource for training your district green team. Uh, here we also have custodial training slides. I've used these to train uh, custodians and facilities teams in a few school districts now. Um, they are available as a PDF, but they're also available in Canva. So if you go click on the Canva link, you can open them in Canva and simply go to file over here and make a copy. And then you can make your own copy and change all the content so it shows all the right information for your district because as we know you know what goes in each bin is going to vary depending on where you are and who your hauler is and where your materials are going so that's there um, another item here is the waste hauling schedule um, this is a, a really key piece of information to get down to make sure that you have hauling service uh, for recycling organics and landfill at a minimum for all of your facilities this is not information that districts always have available to them or have a handle on. So this is a template um, that you can use to help your district get a handle on what service they have for all their locations. Do they have the three streams of service and do they have sufficient service? And that's gonna become more important um, if the district's trying to reduce costs through their hauling service or to track um, how much waste output they're generating. Um, we also have on here some resources developed by Pleasanton Unified's Child Nutrition Services Department, um, things like checklists and scorecards for their facilities, um, inventory and contamination evaluation, and some sample food share procedures. Sometimes that's helpful uh, for districts to see what another district has done um, and feel that that's something that <laughs> is already going on in another district and has been uh, pra practiced and blessed by another district. Um, and then a main item that I always refer to is this project plan, project timeline and tracker. Uh, that covers all of our steps from, you know, starting at zero to get a district compliant uh, with their three streams for SB 1383. And it uh, is a tool that can track all the progress of each site for each goal. Um, moving on maybe to some of our other tabs, we have um, the recycling and composting page. This is resources related to that. Here is a great uh, short video that just covers, you know, one minute and 30 seconds or so of what is SB 1383. This is great for um, all of school staff and school community to just learn what are the bare requirements of the three bin system and food recovery um, and you know how we're gonna get started. Uh, we also have some sample signage and that includes sample signage for food share and take it to go um, that people can customize to their district um, and some training for green teams as well. Uh, and the last thing I will touch on really quickly um, and since we're talking about it today, <laughs> is the food recovery tab. Um, these are some slides that are, you know, basic of covering for your district. You know, what is food recovery? What is required by the law? And some basic places to get started. Um, seems like Lunch Assist has the amazing resources, but maybe we should also link on here as well. Um, and then we have our you know, state and federal policy, that's something that I refer to regularly. Um, so 
to remind the district that this is something that is allowable and these are the specific policies around that. And um, maybe lastly, our um, resources from CalRecycle that Holly and Emily were mentioning as well. Their uh, sample donation agreement, model record keeping tool and food bank locator. I just keep this website pinned so that I can always find it. Um, and those are great things to have so that those nutrition directors can have those templates provided um, by the state. <laughs> Um, so, you know, really at the end of the day, there's a lot of stuff in here. And I'm happy to answer questions about how it's used, but we're just trying to uh, facilitate that process so that all of the um, senior leaders in the district office can work together uh, and support this effort. It is something that generally I think is heavy on nutrition and is heavy on facilities, but um, as long as they have that team, also with their school business officer and their teaching and learning and HR and purchasing, that can all alleviate a lot of the uh, strain of having it only on the nutrition director. Um, so are there any questions I can answer about this or do we have time, Jill? We do, we do have time for questions. Um, so it, it, Devin has a question. What if the school business officer says no? <laughs> this is getting into the politics of, of a district green team. And I, I'm going to give Mallory a shot at this, and I've got some thoughts as well. But Mallory, you go right ahead. Right. So I guess the, the question is if the school business officer says no to um, working on SB 1383. Um, and yeah, that's something that certainly happens. You know, we can say, this is a requirement of the law, your school, your schools are required to do this, but as we all know, sometimes that only goes so far. Um, what I can say is um, that often, you know, while our ideal is to work from the top down and have this be something the district office takes ownership of and leads through their school, sometimes, you know, we have to take other routes as well. Um, so sometimes a more grassroots approach is the way of getting in. Um, you know, letting your school sites know, uh, your student groups, your, you know, teacher groups, parent groups know about SB 1383. Um, we've had success with student groups really grasping onto this because they feel empowered by the fact that there is a law behind the fact that their schools need to do some things <laughs> for the environment. Um, you know, they want to recycle at school, they want to compost, they want to recover food and finding out that their schools are obligated to do it, um, then they get really excited <laughs> and they have some leverage and they can present to their school board um, and ask for these things to be put in place, referencing the fact that um, the district is required to do it. Um, so <laughs> it can be difficult, right? When there's not that support from the top and it doesn't always happen, but um, we've tried some other routes and had success with that as well. Great answer, Mallory. Myra, what would you like to ask? Um, so I guess I just wanted to add to that because I know um, with uh, Devin, I guess uh, one of the things that um, my manager has says like, you have every right as well to file a complaint with CalRecycle. I mean, whether CalRecycle does something, at least it'll put them on the spotlight and, you know, maybe kind of nudge them and push them to having to do something um, and then kind of what Mallory was mentioning, just taking the grassroots approach. Like I know I've found charter schools who kind of have, they're a little bit more self-governing under the district who have taken it upon themselves to have, you know, MOUs with these food recovery organizations. And so um, kind of using them as the example and then going to like my son's school, which is another charter school and saying, hey, by the way, this other charter school is doing this, you know, why don't you guys also do it? And kind of giving them, um, kind of going rogue in a way that I say, um, and having those charter schools pave the way because typically once they implement it, the district kind of says, well, well, maybe we should do it too at the district level. So th those two approaches maybe uh, might help. That's great, Myra. And I will say that, I mean, this is one of those things that can take some community organizing. Um, Mallory mentioned students, um, but one of the things that, you know, is very effective is having folks speak at school board meetings, not once, not twice, but as many times as it takes to make it an agenda item. And so, you know, th these are things that 
as third party, you know, sort of outside the school district chain of command that we have done is to help educate student groups, parents groups, union groups, and others so that they feel articulate enough to go to a school board meeting and advocate for SB 1383 compliance. And that's a role that we can play as well. Cynthia, you have a question. Well, a couple things. First of all, school districts fall under solvent nation standard. I'm talking school districts and their schools. So if it's a school that belongs under the district, they can hire what whoever hauler they want, state, federal, whatever. And the onus is not on the city. The city has to make sure they take an effort to notify the school district, but it's on CalRecycle, CalRecycle. But remember, a charter school, if it's a private charter school and it does not belong in the school district, they are considered a commercial account, a commercial account. And so under that city, they must do 1380. They must do their organics. They do not fall under the school district. So depending on your school, so again, I have 653 campuses, but we have a ton of charter schools that are not, fall, they don't fall under LUSD. They are a private school, private charter, and they must do 1383. So you need to find that out. Um, they're considered a commercial account, not a school district. So I work in I, 25 cities, and if that school is a charter school and doesn't fall under the school district, they have to follow 1383, and they will not get a waiver. The city now has responsibility, and they will not give them a waiver because they fall under 1383. That is great. That's a hot tip. That's what we call a hot tip. That was great, yeah. Cynthia. Just call me. I can tell you, I can tell <laughs> yep. you schools, we, again, school districts, CalRecycle, the city, the only responsibility they have is to notify the school district. But if your school district is out of your school, like, you know, we work LAUSD 700 square miles. So there's like five or six cities that have LAUSD. They have, you know, they have no control. LAUSD 27 floors downtown. Yep. Exactly. So it's you just really need to talk to your school district, you know, but again, find out if that charter school is under your school district. If not, they fall under 1383 as a commercial account. All right. We have reached the witching hour and I want to make sure that we respect everyone's time. We can stay on. Everybody can stay on for a little bit if you are able. But for those of you who have to move on, let me just say we're going to post this recorded uh, session on the CRA K through 12 technical website. Um, and we will email the questions uh, that we didn't get to with Allie and Emily. We will email their answers out to you all when we have it. Um, I really want to thank our presenters for being here today. And so if you all have to go, the next time we'll be meeting is in Q3, where adjacent to Disneyland. And you may see the Go Green Initiative staff at Disneyland the day before the conference starts, but come down to the CRA conference in Anaheim this August. It's going to be a blast. And that's where we will be meeting next. Um, as always, you can reach out to the executive committee members for anything you need. And uh, we look forward to continuing to serve you. So having said that, anybody who wants to stay and ask a few more questions, go right ahead. Paul, I think I saw your hand up. Did I see your hand up, Paul? Just quick, I just wanted to add that uh, from what our local assistance market development staff from CalRecycle has indicated to our jurisdiction uh, for inspections, it would only be um, of the school district, not all the individual 650 schools for Cynthia. Um, so just the school district itself has to maintain the records. Um, and that's all you're inspecting for from our standpoint as a jurisdiction that's enforcing uh, compliance with SB 1383. And really, it's only a couple of uh, parts that need to be kept. Um, it's not health inspections where we're looking in their um, cafeteria and stuff like that. Uh, but it does go back to how, uh, you know, if they would be intentionally spoiling food, you can't guarantee that because you're inspecting a district and not a school where the food is actually being served. Um, so that, um, yeah, doesn't really um, uh, square. But uh, that was just the other comments I wanted to add on to what Cynthia was saying. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we are responsible for um, inspections for SB 1383. 
um, and also reporting on all inspection activity that we've done, regardless of whether it's state agencies, federal agencies, correctional facilities or whatnot. Um, but then it's the difference with the enforcement um, that's key, uh, whereas the enforcement is very lax on school districts, uh, state agencies, um, but a lot more heavy handed on private industry, um, commercial edible food generators, food recovery organizations included, could be facing penalties in the regulations and the locally adopted ordinances. Uh, so that's also something to be mindful of. But thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, thank you, it. Paul. And, yeah, allowing me to jump on as a non-member. Of course. No, we're happy to have you and uh, come back anytime. So thank you for being with us. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your week and we will see you in Anaheim.